people are like, you're too young to be doing this, but it definitely brings a lot of ways for me to get my name out there just because I'm so young doing it. At the end of the day, it's, it's my business. I'm the one who runs everything. Nobody can hold my hand. I have to do that. What in your mind encompasses some of the characteristics that makes the perfect player? The most successful ones are the ones who don't put their whole life into the game. You don't need to be the best. You need to be better than what you are. We finally won the first game and we were so happy. We're like, it's time, it's time. We're locking in, we're locking in. How do you approach sponsorships and sponsors? The way I'd say to kind of approach sponsors is to... It might actually get worse before it gets any better. It's just not too many opportunities in gaming right now. And when I came back home, I checked, I'm like, oh no. I sat down with Travis Smith, who probably is the youngest CEO and founder of an esports team called Take Back Control. At only 15 years old and in a span of just one year, Travis managed to grow his team from just one person to over 60 people, to grow his social followings to over 5,000 followers, and to obviously win many tournaments. We talk about how he managed to achieve all this whilst at the same time balancing with his school career. We touch upon mental health and how he manages to communicate with each member and what is his method in keeping everybody on the same page and on a very healthy mental level. We discuss scouting, coaching, training, and various other tips for esports players, and much, much more. With that said, let's uncover Travis's story. Travis, it's, it's an absolute, absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I think you're a great example for not only people of your age, but also of any age, really. And I'm really interested to speak to you today. I want to start off our conversation by simply kind of rewinding the clock back a little bit and asking you, uh, what are your first memories of video games and how did you get introduced to video games in the first place? Um, I always love telling this story. So I originally started playing video games through obviously Fortnite. Um, right. <laughs> I play a little bit of Roblox, but I never really got into it. I, you know, I still play that. But I definitely like the game that I grinded out and, you know, wanted to join FaZe Clan, you know, big yeah. orgs like that. And um, and gaming is through Fortnite. And that's kind of, I started Fortnite, playing Fortnite during 2018, during 2018, 2019 era. And I just continued playing it and it just kind of boosted my um, dreams in gaming and helped me to start my esports team. Man, that's really awesome. Um, the, the really interesting thing is that you know, at the age of 15, you're here, um, you know, one of the founders of a professional esports team. Um, could you talk about that a little bit and what exactly inspired you to pursue this journey of starting a professional esports team and especially at such a young age? Okay, so um, the the kind of short answer is I just wasn't good at um, gaming, good enough at gaming to kind of go professional in that aspect. And um, I always wanted to just be involved no matter what I was doing. So, you know, I tried to start a few teams before the one that has been successful at the moment, and it didn't go away at all. You know, I was like 13 <laughs> trying to run a team, and it just, no. Um, yeah. And, you know, I just... Like, really, um, gaming is, like, what I like to do. It's definitely my dream. And I wanted to always be involved in the gaming scene, whether it be through professional gaming or through managing the professional gamers, which is, you know, what has been turning out to be, you know, one of the success successful endeavors, sir. Yeah, definitely. And um, kind of speaking to that, um, so you had already had a failure. And what's interesting is that you had a failure and you still decided to try again, which is awesome. And I really salute that. Um, but talk about managing people, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it is uh, an esports team. One of the most important assets probably are the people that are in the team. So, how exactly do you manage to, you know, do you manage to manage the people? <laughs> um, do you have any experiences, perhaps a mentor that is uh, helping you out? Um, I actually, um, when I first started the business, I was went, I went to a conference by one of my friends. His name is Ian Brock. Um, it was more of a team conference, and I met um, a great connection there. His name is Ryan Johnson. He, um, you know, kind of helped me start everything, to be honest. He was the first sponsor that I had towards the team, like, a few, like two months into the team. Um, he signed me up with one of our main sponsors. 
Um, you know, it's just it's just really awesome that I met somebody like that. I definitely do have a few mentors. I use LinkedIn to meet people to help me as well. And I also have a staff team in my team, about 16 people that kind of help me keep things running. Wow. So wait, so your whole esports team right now is consisting of 16 people, correct? We have actually 68 members, but our staff team is 16. Wow. That is all awesome. Wait, let, let me get this straight. So this, uh, this is all your team, correct? Uh, take back control, yes. right? Wow. Can I just say, yes. well done, Travis, honestly, this is a big deal to be able to, uh, have such a big team and to lead it, to manage it. Um, that is, that is a, a, a really big thing. And honestly, well done. Talk to me about your parents. Uh, how, how, how proud are your parents, uh, with all your achievements? Um, um, I'm actually speaking more of a family general term. Uh, everybody mm -hmm. is pretty supportive. My mom, she, you know, she, she, at first she was like, how are you going to do this? And, you know, as I continue doing it, um, <laughs> things started to, you know, speed up. She's like, okay, okay. I'll support it. You know, she's helping me with a lot of things, you know, whenever I need a little extra money to do something, she's right. able to help me with that. Um, she's also just, you know, helping me with a lot of the stuff and my family, um, they're more like, you know, I want you to keep doing this, but also make sure you do your schoolwork, make sure you keep up on your grades and of things course. like that. So it's more of a, since I'm still younger, you know, they, they want me to keep doing it, but they also want me to, you know, focus on school and a few of my extracurricular activities. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a perfect segue to my next question. I was going to ask you, what is the dream here? Are you um, kind of planning to have this esports career uh, as the main concentration in your life? Or perhaps, as you said right now, you're also focusing on your studies and learning something else as perhaps a backup or backup job if things don't go uh, too well. So um, the main goal is, I, you know, I definitely want to stay in esports. Like, that's like my goal and my dream. But, you know, some things just don't work out. So I have a few backup plans. I'm in a choir. You know, I like to sing. Awesome. So, um, and I also want to um go to school for like marketing and social media marketing and stuff like that in case esports just doesn't work you know i just have a backup plan to you know do whatever i need to do and the main goal for my team would just kind of just to blow it up you know what i mean um i definitely want brand recognition and to kind of be seen as one of those esports teams that were like wow we just saw you like this a year ago now you're you know all the way up here you know things like right. that like a hundred thieves shout out to them I'm just, you know, just big teams like that that I look up to. I definitely want to reach the level that they're at right now and the success that they have achieved. No, definitely. And I think you're absolutely on the right track. I think with your motivation and with your dedication, I'm pretty sure you're going you're gonna to get there. Talk to me about how do you get members to join your team? What's the, what's the process here? Were they your friends at the beginning and then perhaps you met someone else on the internet? What's the, what's the process? How do you onboard uh, members? Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a long process, but it's like a little bit simple. Um, so when I first started the team, just kind of going back to when we started it in late December of 2022, um, I obviously was like, yo, homies, you know, you want to join my team? This is going to be yeah. the next big thing, you know, things <laughs> like that. Just cause I was like, no, I didn't really take it serious at that time. I was just like, you know, it's something I'm going to do for like a few months and kind of, you know, shut it down. But, um, it's more of, um, I guess, people reach out to me. We have a website as well um, that people contact us through, or we just use Twitter. You know, we do simple posts like we're looking for this, blah, 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 and blah. And as we've kind of grew like a follower base and a support base, a lot of people start to reach out and send it to their friends. So usually we'll have them just contact my Twitter or my personal Instagram or just on overall contact the team pages or some of the staff members. And that's kind of a recruiting process it's a little bit more details but it's nothing i can kind of remember off my head got it got it well hey you have over five thousand followers on uh, on twitter or an x uh, as we probably should call it now um now how long did it take you to reach that goal that mile milestone of five thousand followers and how, how how old is the team generally um so to reach the goal it took us about seven months we mm -hmm. hit it at in i think during June last year or or July, one of those. Wow. We hit 6,000, but we kind of had a little thing on Twitter where they deleted a lot of our followers. And um, oh, man. the main age throughout the team is 
let's say my age to around 30. So yeah, I started team um December 22nd, I mean 26, sorry, of 2022 and you know I just kind of continued it. So we just hit our one year um two months ago during December obviously. And, you know, we continue to I plan to continue strong and hopefully reach two years this year if things start to speed up. No, for sure. I mean, with with what you have accomplished in one year, I can only imagine what will happen in, in another year's time. Perhaps we can have another talk <laughs> exactly a year from now yeah. to see the progress. <laughs> um, so talk to me about marketing yourself and your team on social media. It's not an easy thing. It's definitely something very unique and special. So what was the process like for you? Did you have to learn it? Did you improvise? Or did you have somebody give you advice? Um, I definitely had to learn it. You know, I didn't have the money when I first started the team. I didn't even have it like a few months into the team to kind of hire a social media manager or just like somebody who could help me with marketing the team. So I, that's like one of the few goals that I did actually learn. I don't think I had really anybody teach me. Obviously I searched up on YouTube a few ways how I could do it, but, um, for a few months and sometimes even now, you know, I run my team's page do some tweets and stuff like that just to make sure the team continues to look good, you know, things like that. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely a, a tricky thing to do because not only is it hard to kind of grasp the the basics of all these social medias, but they're actually always changing and evolving. So kind of to, to, to stay ahead of the game, you need to know all these techniques. And that's exactly my next question. How do you, you know, stay, you know, a step ahead and kind of learn all these trends and learn all these tricks when it comes to social media? Is it something that you discuss in the team internally or is it something that you dedicate a certain amount of time per week to to, to social media, perhaps? Um. So if I'm gonna be honest, I don't usually keep up with the trends. I'm always late, to be honest. <laughs> um, but a key thing that I do when I am trying to put out a tweet or just trying to make something better throughout my team is, search up bigger orgs, like I said earlier, or I get advice from people I met on LinkedIn who own organizations. So whenever there's a tweet or like something that's blowing up right then, that obviously we can kind of reciprocate or just kind of relate to that. Um, I like to search up big orgs like that and kind of figure out how they're putting out the tweet and how I can redo it, if that makes sense. Understood. And you, you mentioned LinkedIn um, quite a bit. I, I assume that's... Um probably one of your go-tos um, in terms of reaching um, the organizations that you're trying to get. Uh, tell me, do you get, uh, do all of them answer or do you sometimes, you know, get ghosted in, in quotes um, or are all organizations looking at you and answering you and, and getting in contact and connecting? So I wish it was like, I guess I wish people were a bit more nicer in the esports scene just <laughs> oh, because man. the esports scene is very competitive. Um, yeah. So I, I'm going to be honest with you. I barely get responses. And when I do, you know, it's something automated or something like that. Um, but I've got a few responses from organization um, members that just, that I've kept as connections, obviously. Um so yeah, I definitely get ghosted a lot and they'll read the message and you can see how somebody reads the message and then they just won't respond. Um, oh, so, you I know, can relate to that. Yeah, it's, it kind of, it kind of, um, it kind of makes me a little bit down, but I'm like, you know, if they see a 15 year old who is kind of doing their thing, you know, who are they going to look out for? Their org or their mine, you know, sometimes it just kind of seems like that. For sure, man. But you know what? I'm pretty sure you're going to look back to this day and sooner rather than later you're going to have people trying to contact you and uh, i'm pretty sure you have learned your lessons and, and 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 you're not going to be one of those evil or bad people in the uh esports team in this esports scene yeah. let's say and teach everybody how things are supposed to be done talking about challenges that's exactly what i was going to talk to you about next so obviously not only is being you know a founder of an esports team a challenge within of itself and managing all these people and um actually performing Right. What are the major challenges that you're facing um, in your journey with your esports team, and how exactly do you manage to overcome these challenges? So, um, I I have very little challenges. I'm not gonna say that as an ego thing. I just I kind of keep things to a way where I don't have to stress myself as much just because of school and basketball and choir things like that. So, I think the biggest goals for me is kind of feeling a little bit burnt out sometimes. 
to where I just don't want to work sometimes. Um, you know, I've had a lot of things go wrong. Like we've lost a lot of followers sometimes. We've had a tweet go horrible. We've got hate sometimes. You know, like <laughs> we've dealt with internet trolls. So I try, oh, um, I try not to, not to, you know, ruin my my brain kind of. For sure. I definitely feel a lot of times that I just don't want to work or I don't want to do almost anything when it comes to working on my team. And another kind of challenge is financially. Obviously, I'm 15 years old. I, I, you know, I don't have a job just yet. I do, I do a few things around the neighborhood to kind of bring me money. But a main reason why we have been kept afloat is through our merchandise, um, through our sponsors. Um, they're also on a jersey. Shout out to them. Right, that's um, awesome, man. And that's really all. You know, I wish I could say more, but you know, if once I get a job this year, you know, hopefully things start speeding up. But um, right. that's definitely the two biggest challenges. And another one is. Just like I said, the esports scene is very competitive. So sometimes you just kind of lose motivation just because you see this team doing this and you were like, why couldn't we do that? And it's just kind of, it's more like a, a mental thing that I've kind of gone through while doing it just because of stress and a few other reasons. No, definitely. It's not an easy thing to go through. And especially it's, it's you know, such a young age. You mentioned this uh, horrible tweet already twice and you really intrigued me. <laughs> what exactly... Uh, happened there and what, what tweet are you talking about uh, is it still visible is it deleted no it, it's nothing like that bad it was just um <laughs> a tweet that we got a lot of hate on we announced a roster for Fortnite, and a lot of people were just like oh, they're not gonna do nothing you know just a lot of people were just clowning the players so that, that day i kind of kind of dropped the ceo founder type of mentality and i kind of went off um on a few people and that's kind of why we lost a few followers but um, over the f last few months, obviously, since that situation has happened, you know, I've been keeping my cool. I've been, you know, ignoring the haters. Obviously, people are going to hate and it doesn't matter what they do. But um, that's definitely what happened. You know, it sucks. But the tweet is still up. Um, but I deleted <laughs> my comments. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Well, maybe I I'll try to search for that tweet <laughs> to see what, what, what yeah. was in it. So you mentioned the esports uh, scene being extremely competitive, and I can fully understand and imagine that, right? Now, how exactly do you think your young age plays a factor into all of this? Do you think perhaps, because I mean, the scene is, the scene has a lot of people, a lot of, you know, children your age, more or less, right? So it's not a completely uncommon thing, but to have them as a CEO is probably a bit uncommon. So how exactly do you think your age plays a factor in you running the company and in you getting responses and in you, in the leaders of the esports community to uh, connect with you? So um, I'm gonna kind of backtrack on that question. So around 4th of July time last year, we lost our whole page. It got hacked and deleted. Um, wow. So after a few days kind of working um, to get it back, we, you know, we just kind of got clowned for that. So a lot of people were kind of like, you know, I'm not, me personally, I'm not fit to run a team, blah, 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 and that. And just because we lost the page and, you know, I couldn't, I didn't really know what to do. Twitter has a horrible way to kind of get people their accounts back. And, you know, they would just give me automated responses. My age definitely plays a big factor in my success as well, just because a lot of people are like, you're doing this at such a young age, I want to help you. Mm -hmm. That's really why my age is such a big key thing when it comes to owning the team, just because that's what people are looking at. They're looking at, obviously, the team succeeding, but they're looking at who's running it. And when they see a 15, a 15 year old, obviously, you know, the first thought doesn't come off as professional or as um, somebody who knows how to run a business. But over time, um, I think a lot of people definitely started to respect me. You know, I've grown a big following on Instagram. I'm sure you've seen. Yeah, um, for sure. Just overall, you know, it definitely, it ruins some factors just because people are like, you're too young to be doing this. But it definitely brings a lot of ways for me to kind of get my name out there just because I'm so young doing it. No, definitely. And I think it's a statement. I definitely think it is a statement uh, that's going to resonate. And within time, I'm pretty sure... Again, just to repeat myself, with your dedication, uh, you're going to see all the um, hard work pay off. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident about that. That's for sure. Let's talk about something good, something fun, right? <laughs> talk to me about, you know, some of the memorable moments or achievements uh, that you have had since you started your team. What's the biggest win? Um, what is the happiest moment 
that you guys have experienced? So I'm going to be honest, we've had a lot of moments, so it's kind of kind of a lot to think <laughs> about. Um, so in the past two months, we've made a lot of money on Fortnite, like close to a thousand. Congrats. Congrats. Um, and we also qualified in FNCS um, a few weeks ago to one of our players. So that's a big achievement this year, and it's already started. Um, it's amazing. We won a COD League um, last year. Our first, our first photo shoot was a big um, key factor. I have mm -hmm. a jersey upstairs that we used. I um, think that was recently, right? You posted that on Instagram, the photo shoot? Well, this was our second. This was our second. Oh, okay. Uh, got it. Shoot. Got it. I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's definitely a lot. Um, and in one year, so much that happened that I, I could say. Tell me, tell me what's Did, resonated. I, something, I, something like pr probably your first win maybe could be something special, right? Okay. Yeah. So our first win was in... Um, it was in Call of Duty. That was when our first game, and that was when we finally won a game. I'm gonna be honest. Another big key moment in the team was when we were um, we had a Valorant roster about a few months ago, and it was a pretty rocky season. Um, and we finally won the first game, and we were so happy. We we're like, <laughs> you know, it's time, it's time. We're locking in, we're locking in, and then it just you know everything kind of went to kind of went a little down after that. Um. Happens. It's it definitely happens. a lot. Yeah, it's definitely a lot that we've done, and a lot of achievements that we have completed, and you know, it keeps us going. You know, I wish I could say everything, but if I did, we were gonna be here for the next five hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I got all the time in the world. <laughs> um, but anyways, that is you know that is so cool because I can I can fully understand how it must feel to get that win. You know that that must have been uh, you know absolutely insane. Now. I mean, obviously, um, at the beginning of the journey, you didn't have any sponsors. Now you do. And actually, one of them is, is quite serious. It's quite a big, big company. So talk to me about, you know, how do you approach sponsorships and sponsors? And perhaps if you could share a little bit of advice for anyone else looking to approach a sponsor and start a conversation with them. Like earlier said, um, Ryan Johnson, the one I met at the conference in 2022, he got me in contact with I Play Games, the owner of this company, Kevin Fair. Um, from there, I kind of DM'd him. I'm like, are you able to help us with this? You know, this is ways we could benefit you, logo on the jerseys, a few other things. I won't give too many details, obviously. Um, that's definitely, I don't, I don't really know. I don't remember exactly how. But it's like the first time that I messaged Kevin Fair from I Play Games, it just we just connected. You know what I mean? Is he was like instantly, I want to help you. How can I do it? Um, with NT Esports, the one right here, I met Nick Turner, the owner of this company, through LinkedIn. Obviously, mm -hmm. I contacted him. I'm like, you know, my take back control is looking for sponsors. Um, these are the way we can benefit you. We had a meeting and. The way I'd say to kind of approach sponsors, if you were looking for them, obviously, is to come off as a friendly professional aspect. So don't come off like, will you sponsor us? Please, I need the money. I need the money. Come off as, um, you know, will you sponsor us? We can help you. You can help us. And this is how. Not a way that we can just kind of benefit only off of you, but the way that we can benefit both companies and a professional aspect in the esports scene. I was got it. Got it, man. That, that's, that's a big deal. Honestly, that's a big deal. So talk to me, except for perhaps, you know, financial gain and, and exposure, what other benefits do sponsors give you per your team and you personally? Um, you know, do they give advice? Do they um, provide you perhaps with equipment or a place to train? What exactly, what else do they incorporate in themselves? So our sponsor right here, he is from Chicago and this one is from the UK. So we definitely have been looking into better ways how we can benefit off of the sponsorship. But a key thing, a key main thing, sorry, that we've got is obviously money. And a second reason is connections. You know, I went, sorry, I'm not going to say too much, but I did go on a podcast about a month ago from a connection that Nick Turner was able to give me. So, you know, things like that, it just kind of, puts a more activating aspect for me and my team just because I probably wouldn't have met almost anybody. I definitely wouldn't have met you because I got advice from Nick Turner to go on Matchmaker, obviously. Right. <laughs> um, so you know, nice. it's just okay. more of a mentorship type of thing. Yeah. 
And it definitely helps me because I know I'm still young and I'm still learning, obviously. That's definitely a big factor when you have this, because, you know, sometimes you uh, have sponsors or investors who are in a way silent, right? They just kind of provide a certain uh, bit of information or a bit of aid, and then they just remain silent. But when you have a sponsor that is proactive and is trying to help you in more ways than one, that definitely is a very, very big advantage. And since you said the two sponsors that you have go above and beyond to help you, I think that is absolutely awesome. And you are learning a lot, I'm pretty sure, which is, you know, something very unique as well. So talk to me about uh, how do you set and prioritize goals for your team? Now, you have a few teams, right? You have a Call of Duty team, Fortnite, Valorant, Rainbow Six Siege, right? And perhaps a few others and all these people. So how do you set goals? Kind of, can you go a little bit more into depth on that question? So. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So you have uh, these different teams, right? These different different teams play different games. The different games have competitions on different dates. They require different strategies to play them, um, perhaps even sometimes different machines to play them. And you as the leader of the team have to set goals to your uh, other team members so that they train and play well and they maintain to a certain schedule. So how exactly do you set these goals to your team? and uh, do you write them down? Perhaps you say in 2024, we want to do this competition, this competition, and this competition. And in order to succeed in these three competitions, these are the mini goals that we have to follow to achieve the main goal. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be funny right here. The main goal obviously is to win. Right. You know? So a few reasons that um, I'm able to set goals for every roster that we currently have is I look at their past stats, how they've competed under other teams, and kind of how we can overachieve but also stay in the same area to where they're not trying to overwork their self. So, for example, I'm going to say for our Valorant roster, um, you know, I went through their past things. I'm like, you know, I'm going to get you guys a manager. That's going to obviously help them to scrim and get scrims and get into tournaments. I got them a coach, which I also activated their skills. And then for me, you know, I told them the main goal, I want you guys to at least get, you know, every other win, if that makes sense. That's not obviously what I said, but I said something around the where, you know, you're not overworking yourself, but you're not playing horribly to where you're kind of also playing as yourself, if that makes sense. I don't usually make too many goals. You know, I, that's why I just said I hire managers to kind of do that. Got it, when yeah. I do, I usually look for at least like top five on leaderboards things mm -hmm. like that for where our apex legends roster, you know, I've, I've been looking for top fives, which they've been giving me um, for, let's say our Fortnite leaf qualified, which obviously is what I wanted, but I also wanted them to kind of focus on their mental health as well to where they're right. not also once again, overworking their self to where they're wanting to play the game and wanting to get better and not can also take criticism as well. So that's the big factors on how I do make goals and how I kind of keep things going. Understood. Yeah, mental health is a very important aspect that you mentioned, and I want to get to it just a little bit later. Um, you mentioned right now that you um, uh, find a certain player, and then you get a coach to coach that player. So these are kind of my two separate questions for the moment. The first one being uh, what I would refer to probably as headhunting, right, or hunting for talent. So you mentioned you look at... Um, leaderboards and you kind of scout uh, potential, you know, team members that you would like to approach, how exactly do you approach them? Um, I approach them on a friendly, what's up, bro, type of thing. <laughs> Obviously not what's up, bro, but more of like, yeah. a, hey, I need your help for this. Can we have a meeting soon? And we can talk about things on how much you will be paid, how often you can work and how often you can, you know, just be a player or a coach, as you said, or a manager. That makes sense. So we work around the schedules and we, in that meeting, we go over schedules, we go over financial, how they can be paid, how much they want to be paid, how long they will obviously be working for the team and what's their past experience. So that could be for bigger orgs like that, which obviously they're probably going to want more money. And usually, you know, I'm not able to cover some like, you know, I'll stay in contact, but if I can't come to this balance, then we won't be able to work with you, obviously. That is very interesting what you just said, and um, that's you know a whole technique within of itself. But these um, talent or, or these gamers that you're approaching, are they part of another team when you're approaching them and you're kind of luring them to come join your team, or are these solo players? 
So I'm gonna be honest. A no can do in the esports scene when you have a team is poaching players, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, it doesn't it doesn't come off as positive at all, and it, it's a lot of times the reason why a lot of teams shut down because they get you know took down for you know taking players. So I usually look for free agent players or people who are like my team is you know letting me explore options. If they're also in a team and signed under a contract, it just it doesn't work at all. And it's usually going to turn out as we're trying to double roster and we're trying to, you know, just take them from that team, which is not what I want to do. You know, if that's your player, you can have him. I'll find another one. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> Got it. That's inter- And so these, um, the people that you approach sometimes could be old, older than you, right? Sometimes even quite significantly. Yeah. Yeah. So does that intimidate you at all when you when you approach them? Honestly, um, I think of myself just as much as I think of another person. You know, you know, you might be 50 years old and I'm going to contact you like you're, you know, the same person that I am. Got it. Obviously, I'm going to be like, hello, because um, you're a little bit some. It, let's go for a higher perspective. If they're a little bit older than me, I'm not going to be like, what's up? Hey, how you doing? Not on like a more professional slash friendly thing. So I'm going to be like, hello, how's your day going? Would you be interested in joining the team? But for somebody such as like 18, 17, 16, 15, you know, things like that, they don't take it to heart. They're more like, yeah, what's up, bro? What's up, bro? How you hey, feeling? Awesome. How you feeling? Let me, yeah, I'm down. I'm down. You know, um, oh, that's I've amazing, been trying man. to kind of keep it more of a professional way whenever I do contact people, but you know, I still want to be myself. You know, if I'm, you know, kind of acting like a robot, I just don't feel like myself and I just don't want to do anything. Yeah, for makes- sure. For sure. Oh, that is actually awesome that you, you know, basically, in other words, you don't get intimidated. And that is really, really great because, you know, I could imagine a scenario where speaking to someone who's older, maybe 20 years old, 19 or something, could uh, be intimidated, intimidating, sorry. And, and you seem to overcome that, which I think is absolutely awesome. So now I would like to address mental health. And I think that's a very, very important aspect and something that's really, you know, a make or break aspect in the whole gaming scene and esports scene for sure. So how exactly do you ensure the well-being and mental health of your team members? I'm going to be honest. I could do way better than what I have <laughs> been doing. since. Um, I don't want to say it like this, but I kind of like to kind of put myself a little bit forward than a few people when it comes to my mental health personally. But as you know, I'm still a founder. I'm still a CEO. I still have to run things. Absolutely. So the way that I kind of keep ahead of just figuring out how people are feeling and how, what, what can I do to help you? I literally straight up text everybody in the team. I no, I send it in the group chat that we have. I'd be like, Hey, I'm going to be doing a mental health check. or I'm going to be checking up on everybody to see how we're feeling activity check, things like that. And I'll just text everybody. I'm like, Hey, how can I help you? How are you doing? Blah, 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 and blah. Usually wow. they'll contact me. They'll be like, hey, I'm I'm fine, man. You know, I'm fine. I mean, if you, they usually, um, whenever I do get personal messages from people, it's usually like sometimes like I want to take a break. I need a break. And I'm like, um, okay. And they're like, please don't take my spot on the team. I'm like, you know, I need a break <laughs> sometimes too. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I'm not going to kick you off the team just for that, obviously. Um, so yeah, I, that's the main reason how I kind of just stay ahead of keeping things in a mental health term. Just, you know, just DMing them like as a friend, you know what I mean? Some people, sometimes people just need somebody to talk to and I'm not going to lie. I'm not the best talker when it comes <laughs> to things like that. Just because I also go through a lot at home and stuff like that. But of course. when I do have the right mood and I, and when I am in the right mental space, you know, I try and help as pe- pe- people on my team as much as I can. Sorry. Understood. Yeah, that's that's wonderful, really. So you mentioned also like uh, activity check, right? That's what you said. Could you define what exactly you mean by that? So um, throughout the group chat, we've had times where people are just not there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They're in the group chat, they're seeing the messages, or sometimes they're not seeing the messages and they're just not here. So a way that I kind of like to see are people still interested in being the team so I don't hold a spot for somebody who would be or overall, just kind of see where are you at right now. You know what I mean? Sometimes I won't kick them out. You know, if they're like, you know, I've been going through a lot, you know, I, I need some space. And I'm like, I'm cool with that. I mean, sometimes everybody needs some space, obviously, just because 
even when you're not like the biggest creator on the app or something like that. You know, it still takes a lot of you to stream six hours a day staring at a computer yeah. and just, you know, kind of putting your life, your gaming life before other things. And, you know, people obviously go through family problems and things like that. So whenever I do activity checks, I sit in a group chat. I'm like, hey, I'm going to DM all 68 of you guys. Um, obviously, if I've heard from them in that past week, I won't DM them because, you know, if you told me that you're going through this, I'm not going to bother you again. Um right. Right. <laughs> but when I do, I sit in the group chat. I'm like, I'm going to contact everybody. And if you do not, I'm going to contact you guys for three days, a point of time. That's what I was doing. Three days. Hey, one day. Hey, again. Hey, again. If you don't respond, you will be suspended from the team and or kicked. And if you do respond, um, obviously, you're good. Sometimes I like to not kick people and just kind of put them on a suspension until they do contact me because, you know, somebody's family member has passed. They're obviously not going to take the time to DM me. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, that's kind of why I try not to kick anybody. And I try to keep more on suspension and or if I'm just not in the mood and I don't feel like ruining anybody's or I see they read the message. And that's probably when they're probably going to be kicked. Wow, that is awesome. That is quite, you know, very um, mature and very thoughtful of you to actually do that. And I think that is, you know, a very important aspect of of esports. And you as a CEO, you know, really have to take care of the team. And that's exactly what you're doing, which is great. Um, talk to me about sort of the typical day for an esports team player in your team, or perhaps for yourself, um, you know, to prepare for the next competition or the next tournament? What is a typical day like? How do you guys train and prepare? Um, so um, I'm going to kind of think about a past experience with our COD members. You know, so we start off the day, obviously at 8 in the morning. I'll probably have school that day. So before I had school, I'm like, I DM all of them. I'm like, hey, you guys ready? Um, Are you guys still on for tonight? Let's get it, blah, 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 blah. About maybe 5 p.m. usually when the games are. Um. I turn off a few things. I'm on the stream. I got analytics up on the side. I got the messages on the side. And I kind of get in a meeting with the coach. You know, the coach usually texts them or gets in a quick call, you know, goes over strategies, go over, goes over how they're going to do this and that and how they're going to play the best at, the best way that they can. Um, That's literally, it's that simple. You know, we contact them. We're like, hey, y'all still ready? Um. Are you guys in the right mental space? Obviously, are you guys in the right head? Because if you're mad, you're you're not happy, or you know, just kind of in a a okay mood, usually that's okay to play. But if you're just totally angry at the world, you're nine times out of ten you're not gonna play good. Obviously, right. Right. so of we're just usually make sure that they're still able to play in the first place, and that they are still interested in playing because you can't force anybody to do something because that's always gonna lead to burnout. Uh, so what you're saying is that. Uh, you're going to school in the morning, so you're basically half a day, half a day in school, and then when you come back, you are training and preparing for uh, your next tournament. But at the same time, you have responsibilities for your school, right? How exactly do you balance everything? That's a lot. I'm thinking of myself when I when I was 15. I'm not sure I would have been able to do that. That's a big, big undertaking. How exactly do you manage to? Uh, do both of them and also your personal life, right? That matters. So I'm going to be honest with you. Last year, I I kind of dedicated my life to the team. That's not me staying in the house all day. Obviously, I went out with friends to get a break. But whenever I'd be out with friends, I would just be checking my phone. I'd be like, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. My mind would just yeah. not pay attention to where I'm at. What <laughs> am I doing? You know what I mean? Right. Um. So... I'm, I, I don't know how to balance it, obviously. You know, even in school, sometimes I'm checking my team page. But lately, starting this year, I've been kind of, I guess, putting in work hours or, like, implementing that. So I say, you know, I'm working from 3 to 5. I mean, 3 to, like, let's say 7 for anybody who wants to DM me. Do it now because after 7, I'm, I'm done, you know, because I don't I've, – I've definitely experienced a lot of times where I've just wanted to quit. Um, right. One of my team is because it just becomes too much at some times. And um, I'm still I'm still young. So, you know, I like to also enjoy my teenage life. Of course. Um, exactly. And just go out with friends, obviously. So, you know, I could do way better with managing all of it. But um, I've been trying to kind of 
project my time that I work on my team to kind of not be in how much time I spend outside of it. Got it. Got it. So in a way you're setting boundaries for yourself, right? You're sent or time boundaries for yourself in order to be able to enjoy, you know, all parts of life and also undertake all your responsibilities. Um, wow. That is a big thing to, to, to do at such a young age. I mean, I'm saying it now, but I'm just comparing yourself to myself, right? I'm thinking of when I was 15 years old, I definitely would be, would be struggle, struggling to do something like that. Um, talk to me about, uh, you know, some of the challenges that you've faced in terms of your team members, like perhaps you needed to fire somebody uh, or in other words, let somebody go, or perhaps somebody came to you with a certain problem that had to be addressed. Um, talk to me about th these types of situations, if perhaps you had encountered them. And if you did, how exactly do you go about, uh, you know, manning up and, and actually doing it? So, um, honestly, I just started getting way better at firing people who needed to be fired. <laughs> um, awesome, so man. I've wow. had a bunch of, bunch of reasons that people have came to me, you know, one time, unfortunately we had a member who was racist on stream oh, that geez. we didn't know about. So we had to, I, you know, I had to be, become, you know, I, we, were, we already started gaining the hate. So, you know, I my had to goodness. get right in the moment because I was at church. So I didn't look at my phone at all. And when I came back home, I checked. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so I contacted him. I'm like, hey, you're out the team. You know what I mean? I had to make a public statement and things like that. So um, it's, it's definitely that been a so lot of times where we've, we've had a lot of ways to fire people. Mm -hmm. um, before, you know, nobody likes firing almost anybody, I'm sure. Especially if you've become friends with them or, you know, you know, know their backstory, just what they've been through. But you know, I've kind of started to become to that. Like, at the end of the day, it's it's my business. You know, I'm the one who runs everything. I'm not gonna. Nobody can hold my hand. Nobody can tell me I gotta do this. You know, I I have to do that. I can't have nobody else tell me what I need to do when obviously I know what's needed. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Absolutely, no, definitely. I think and myself included can actually learn a few things from you. Um, I think you're quite mature for your age because. It's not an easy thing. Um, definitely, I'm not taking the um, example of of the racist guy. That should be taken care of swiftly. But you know, of of any other examples where it's a bit of a different situation, I would assume it is difficult, but it has to be done. You have managed to overcome that, um, which is you know quite uh, very very awesome and respectful. Definitely. What do you think, in your opinion, are some of the most important skills for a team member to possess when uh, talking about esports. Now, I'm not speaking about the talent of playing the game itself. I'm talking about um, teamwork, you know, openness, right? Uh, the ability to listen, the ability to take uh, criticism, and the ability to come and say, you know what? I did this wrong. You told me this. Now I'm going to, you know, get better. Um, in, what in your mind encompasses um, some of the characteristics that makes the perfect player? So um, that makes the perfect player, in my opinion, is, I'm going to be honest with you, like blunt completely. In the esports scene, a lot of players have huge egos. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what makes the perfect player is just being open to what the coach is saying, what your owner is saying. Um, that's not too often seen. A lot of people also need to kind of not stress themselves. A lot of times when I'm in meetings or when I'm talking to players, they're kind of like, I need to be the best. And I'm like, you don't need to be the best. You need to be better than what you are, obviously. You know, sometimes people aren't the best player but you don't always need to be the best the one who makes the millions of dollars if you're making a thousand dollars you should still be happy with your success and what you've done mm -hmm. and sometimes it's just hard for people to kind of understand that because they're like well i'm i'll, I'll go into fortnite aspect the player he was like well i need to be the next booga you know i need to be the next one who wins world cup i'm like right how like how often <laughs> are you know people you know what i mean 
Yeah, if you're not sure. already up there, how often are you doing that? You know, you just won a hundred dollars. You should be happy about you winning a hundred dollars. It's not about you winning that million dollars because if you keep up your grind and just not let the stress get to you about wanting to be the best player, you will be the best player because you're not going to be stressing yourself. You're not going to be like, I need to play this many hours because he's playing as many hours. No, you need to play as many hours as you can. You know, a lot of times when I'm seeing players, um, the most successful ones are the ones who don't put their whole life into the game. You know what I mean? Okay, They don't stay at home all day. They don't quit school just because they want to play the game. The ones who are most successful, they go to school, actually, and they go to content creation, and they do more things to where they're not just only staying home. You know, a lot of people like to say, well, if I go out with my friends this day, I can't go out with my friends the next day because I need to be playing the game. I can't go with my friends to that party because I need to be playing that game. It's, it's just... It's not true. You know what I mean? It's not always true. And um, a big key factor on how esports teams even, even esports players even do good is just because they get fresh air. You know, they right. they live their life. Right. You don't need to spend ten hours a day clicking all the keyboards and doing all the mouse things. You know what I mean? Right. You know, just not becoming of no life. If that makes sense. No offense right. to anybody who does that, but obviously. You, you need to live your life, you know. Gaming is going to always be there, and you're always going to be able to play the game. And on weekends, that's probably the best time. But during school days, skipping your homework just to, you know, do a few things, it just won't work out in the long run. Well, for sure, definitely. I think you're quite the motivator, uh, Travis, quite honestly speaking. It's, either it's something Thank innate you. in you, which is which is absolutely great. Either it's something that you've learned along your way. But I think you are you know, a great motivator and absolutely a great team leader, honestly. I think I'd be happy if I was in your team, um, that's for sure. So really, really well done on that. To continue here, uh, talk to me, you know, what are your thoughts about, you know, the future of the esports industry and the potential of its growth? What do you see that is to come in, in esports? So right now, esports is in a very, a very messy type of predicament, if that makes sense. So um, I don't know if you've been staying in touch, but, you know, after 20 or like during 2020 to like around 2023, gaming was at an all time high because all you could do is just be stuck in the house. But now, you know, it's 2024, people are going outside, you know, it's more of a... I'm not going to say the esports scene is dying, but it's becoming more to like a hobby, if that makes sense. Which is why a lot of big players have retired and a lot of professional players have retired. Um, so the esports scene right now, it's a, it's a little bit rocky. Um, I really don't know where it's heading at the moment. You know, it's obviously not completely dead. You know, there's still dying fans out there that just yeah. want to see their esports scene play. For but sure. But it, could, it, could, it, could, it definitely is not that, at the amount that it was a few years ago. Um, hmm. if I'm going to be honest in about like five years, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't even say anything because it could get better, but it really could just stay at the time that it is, or it could get worse. There's actually no telling because, um, in the esports scene, it's, it's just so competitive for teams. Like that's my size, 5,000 followers, 4,000 followers, you know, and also big teams, you know, obviously if you have a family member, they're going to buy your merch. But if you have a supporter that supports another team, you release the same merch on the same day, they're going to support the bigger team. You know, I've had somebody yeah. who supports my team and also like Sentinels, for example, and they released merch the same exact day that we did. And they instantly ran to Sentinels. So it's just, it's pretty hard um, to kind of make money, which is why esports teams have been shutting down and a lot of reasons why they've been closing. Like, for example, speaking on something like FaZe Clan, when they released their stock, it depleted completely. It's under $1. You no, know, and they're, you know, just not in the best position. So hopefully esports in the next five years finds the, like, way to make money. This billion-dollar industry is so many ways. It's just people aren't utilizing it. And I'm going to be honest, I'm not utilizing it as well because I haven't learned too much about the esports scene when it comes to making money other than, the occasional things like release and march tournaments and things like that. But how often are you going to win a big tournament and take that percentage? You know what I mean? No, for sure. Uh, you actually, yeah, that, that's a really serious topic that you mentioned there. Um, it's quite interesting what you're saying about the fact that it might actually get worse before it gets any better. 
uh, in a way that's quite, uh, you know, scary and a bit sad because I don't want it to go that way. But um, do you think it's because of the, let's say, like you said, of the complete dominance of big teams and the fact that, you know, smaller teams find it harder and harder, harder and harder to grow? Why do you think that is? Because... Um, the t- it's a cycle, right? The team wins and the team loses. There's not always one team that's always, uh, you know, on top, right? Why do you think these big dominant teams are actually s- such a big, f- you know, footprint in the esports industry? So I'm going to be honest with you. In this kind of aspect, um, there's two main reasons why teams are very dominant in the team, in the scene, like big teams, like, like said, 100 days, things like that. Um, first, let's go to Call of Duty, you know, no scoping, FaZe Clan, which is why they've been so dominant, Optic, which who've been winning every single time. Yeah. Um, Hunter Thieves, who've been winning in Valorant, um, obviously sometimes in Call of Duty, when in Fortnite, FaZe Clan, you know, it's just not too many opportunities in gaming right now. If we're going to be honest, um, when we talk about esports, when I've asked people about esports, even when I'm going to ask you. The main games that people are going to say is Fortnite, Call of Duty, and maybe, you know, maybe Apex Legends or Valor. There's no other game. It's not too many games. You know, right. a team is already built off of that. And if we go to like FaZe Clan, when they were built off of Fortnite, no team could take the way that they were being built because they already were in that fan base and they were already having supporters in that space, which is why it's so hard for kind of people to do anything because, you know, I think big games like Fortnite and Valorant and things like that, they kind of, in a way, ruined the esports scene to where small, smaller games like, um, what's the game that just came out? Um, I have no, like the finals. I don't know if you heard about that. Smaller games like that, they've just started to, you know, close mm-hmm. things down and kind of shut things down just because, you know, it's an FPS game. It's a shooter game. But if you have a favorite game like Fortnite or a game like Call of Duty that people are always playing, the first game that you're going to go to is Call of Duty or Fortnite. You're not going to go to that new game that everybody thinks is fun because everybody's going to be like, well, Fortnite's been keeping afloat for all these years. It's obviously better. It's obviously doing this and that. And Epic Games, people, um, Activision who made Call of Duty and Fortnite, they're amazing at what they do. But in a way, they did ruin the scene to where people don't want a change. They don't want this team to come up because wow, the team that's, that's so already built in that space, it's is not going to be able to, well, it is going to be able to kind of run over every single team that is coming into that space. That is actually such an interesting thought, what you just said. And to be honest with you, I've never thought about it that way. So if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that Epic, Activision, and whatnot are not necessarily improving or making different games that are going to be huge and big just because of the huge influence of the big esports team that are currently uh, center stage, right? Yeah. Oh wow! And so basically, they're scared that uh, these 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 big teams will not play that game, that new game, and 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 the game is not going to be popular. Wow, that is so. That is a very unique thought. I had never uh, thought of that. <laughs> I really hope perhaps that 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 changes. So, could you tell me how exactly do you um, you know measure success for your team? Because you know, I don't think esports is only about you know winning games. Pretty sure it's also about, you know, the experience, the friendships, right? And the progress that you make. So how exactly do you, you know, measure the success apart from uh, winning tournaments for your team? Just getting the name out there. Um, Another big way that we continue things is through um, us hosting events here in Chicago. That's another big way that we um, count as success just because, you know, You can't always host an event just because sometimes it takes a lot of money. Oh, for Um, sure. Yeah. (laughs) And also another big key that we call success is just um, obviously follower, follower gain, and just ways that people can find out the team. You know, if we can change another person's way of thinking about the esports scene and if they're like, man, forget teams, you know, but they join my team and they're like, hey, I love this. You know what I mean? Um, my last team didn't do so good, but this one is doing really good, which I've had a lot of people tell me. Um, that's another way that I kind of feel better and call it as success. 
Wow, that's really cool. That is, that is really, really, you know, quite nice. And I think you're going the right direction. As we mentioned before, today it's a little over 5K, but a year from now, that number should be completely, completely different. So uh, talk to me about the different teams that you have on. So first of all, how many different teams do you have on your esports team? We have five. We have about five. All right, so that's Fortnite, Call of Duty, Valorant, Rainbow Six Siege, and the last one would be? Um, Fortnite, Call of Duty, Valorant, Rainbow Six Siege, and Apex Legends. And Apex Legends, got it. Which one of those is most successful from the teams, you think? At the moment, uh, every roster is doing really well, but at the mm -hmm. moment, Fortnite is doing extremely well. Nice. Uh, it's kind of crazy to see it as well. You know, we went from one of those teams that didn't really win Fortnite to, you know, winning almost everything. So uh, basically, you actually train for this, right? So there's a, uh, how exactly do you train? Is there a certain software that you open up? I mean, despite despite playing the game itself and training while playing the game, I'm talking about other aspects, like different software that you used to play. Do you try different mice or different keyboard? Like, what's the, um, what's the strategy to improve? It's really about how you want to improve. A lot of people think ways to improve is once again staying at home all day doing this and doing that but a key way to improve at any video game is finding obviously equipment that you can use that feels good to you so that could be a different mouse like a g pro weight a razor viper um obviously a keyboard you know keyboards come in different sizes 75 percent 100 percent 60 percent 25 percent um <laughs> which i've played on all of them just to find the right one um, so those are the two big things. And also another thing is just kind of being open to failing. A lot of people okay. think when you fail in tournaments and when you don't do well, you know, you're horrible, you know, you need to quit. But to be honest, you know, failing is like probably the best thing that you can do because you learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. That's not awesome. saying yeah. you should always fail, but when you do fail, you know, you shouldn't take it as a, a disappointing thing you should also take it as a learning experience and kind of record or like go through things that you did in that last game and kind of reflect to do things that you wouldn't do and if that makes sense uh, travis i run a section an ongoing section on my podcast where my previous guest leaves a question for my current guest so i would like to ask you the question from my previous guest if that if that is okay Okay, sounds good. I think that's my question that I would put out there to anyone in this industry. Like, what do you want your legacy to be? If you can plant this seed, knowing that it's going to grow long beyond like your initial kind of creation, what, what do you want it to evolve into and how do you want to impact people? Wow, that's a deep, that's a deep question. Right. Uh, <laughs> well... Honestly, I want my legacy that I want to leave behind is just, you know, being seen as the kid who was able to do what he needed to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of didn't, I, I didn't grow up with anything. You know, we didn't have money at all. And, you know, a big thing that I want to be seen for is just what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Um, just, you know, giving a better name to minorities like myself obviously of my skin color or mm -hmm. just younger people of any race if that makes sense um so i just want to be seen as motivation and that you know you can do anything that you put your mind to no matter what mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely wow travis awesome answer man really uh really really great answer and uh, from the bottom of my heart wishing you nothing but the best and i'm sure you're going to get to achieve all the goals that you set for yourself and now if i may ask you to leave a question for my future guest please so uh, the question that I want to say is. And another question that is recurrent in, in the podcast, and I ask everybody because everybody has their own answer and each answer is correct because there's no incorrect answer. And that question is, what is a video game for you? Is obviously something online. It could be anything. Um, for me, a video game or yeah, just a video game is something that brings me happiness, if that makes sense, right. or just an escape, right? if that makes sense. So, you know, coming home from a long day at school, you know, nothing to do. Obviously, the first mind would be go work in the business, but sometimes I just don't want to do that. I just want time to myself. So a video game is just something that can kind of help me escape from the reality, if that makes sense. 
Absolutely. Awesome answer. Actually, um, uh, a very similar answer to one of my previous guests. So that's that's a common common theme that that goes on, that the fact that it helps you escape reality, um, which which I fully agree with a hundred a hundred percent. Travis, to to finish off uh, our conversation here, could you just kind of leave your closing remarks or your final thoughts or perhaps a word of advice to anybody looking to go into esports and uh, you know just figuring the way out in in the industry currently? First, I'd like to say thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, it you, means Travis. a lot, and it's you're amazing. You're an amazing host, and it thank definitely you. has helped me. I loved your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my advice would be to just keep going. You know, sometimes things aren't always going to be a hundred. And if you just keep going sooner or later, you're going to hit that sweet spot. If that makes sense. You know, I, you know, I started this with nothing. I didn't even have a business plan. It's like a few <laughs> months in. Um, oh, wow. But just, you know, I kept going, you know, I didn't stop moving and whatever you do, just don't bring yourself down. You know, failing is okay. And if needed, fail a few times, fail a few times, you know, take it as advice and reconstruction of what you need to do for your next, for your next move. That makes sense. Awesome. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Travis, thank you so much. Thank you for the compliments uh, that you sent my way. I would like to tell you a huge thank you to yourself uh, for being a guest and being an awesome guest at that. Um, I personally learned a lot and I'm sure anybody listening will do too. Um, from the bottom of my heart, I'm wishing you absolutely nothing but the best. I want you to succeed. I know you will succeed. I'm so interested to have another conversation with you a year from today to see your progress, to see how everything is going. And um, just honestly wishing you, you know, you know what I would say? I wouldn't wish you an obstacle-less journey because having obstacles is great because you learn from them. But I want you to have obstacles that you can easily jump over and, you know, become wiser, smarter, and better while you uh, progress in your journey. So thank you so very much. Thank you so much once again for having me. And I appreciate <laughs> your kind words. Thank you, Travis.